Okay, I guess we'll get started without um, a video, but um, I'm Emily Zaber. I'm a, from the Cleveland Clinic and I'll be moderating this next block of sessions that are all about reporting and data visualization. So our first talk is by Kara Thompson on building a data viz design system for a medical research project. So we'll go ahead with that video now. It's always such a joy hearing what people are doing with R, and particularly in the field of medicine. So as a patient who understands something of what it takes to pull off these projects, uh, let me just take a few seconds to say thank you and well done uh, for all the work that you are doing. Um, I'm going to be talking today about the process involved in building a data viz design system that allows a research team to get from plots that look like this to plots that look like this with just two lines of code. But we've only got 10 minutes, so without further ado, let's get cracking. So what is a data viz design system? The best way to think about it is data viz friendly brand guidelines. We've got a set of colors, a set of fonts, and some simple rules that we can follow to make sure that our plots always look nice and unified. Now, what is it that makes it data viz friendly specifically? Well, we want to be thinking about purposeful color semantics, which is something that I cover in, in workshops, but you wanted to think about colors that evoke certain things that you're talking about, certain metrics, or things like color intensity to signal more of something. Uh, we want to have some data viz friendly text formatting. Uh, we might have some preferred geoms that we want to use as a team. And in all of this, we want to be mindful of accessibility guidelines. And the good thing about this is that the constraints here are tighter than they would be for a more generic uh, set of brand guidelines. So we can apply this to our graphs, to our tables, but also outwards to our presentations and documents and get some really nice looking outputs for the research team. But why would we do this? Why bother having a data viz design system? Well, it's about so much more than just pretty graphs. It gives us a clear visual identity. If we're doing a large project, we're going to want to be pub published in lots of different um, outlets and having a clear visual identity will mean that we're recognized as the team that has produced all of that. Um, it saves you a lot of energy in terms of decision making and trial and error. Um, and if you're doing it in our stats, then you can automate the boring stuff that some of us actually quite, find quite fun um, to focus on the stuff that needs your expertise. There are three key aspects to the data viz design system. There's the functional aspects. So we're looking at text hierarchy, the number of colors that you need, any symbolisms that we can use, um, and of course, accessibility. Um, then we've got the aesthetic side. So we want it to look on brand. We want it to have the right kind of personality in it. Um, and there's some nice little extras that we can add in, some backgrounds and some options that we can toggle on and off. Um, and finally, there's the implementation side of it. So we want to have clear documentation. We want to automate it, preferably as a package if we can. But we need to have enough flexibility that this acts as a foundation for your creativity rather than something that's going to just constrain you too much. So um, let's have a look at this project that I've been working on. So here's Dr. Claire Meek's website. Um, and from this, we can start to gain a bit of an appreciation of the colours that she has associated with her research project. Um, we see a professional uh, who also looks fairly approachable, um, and we can gain a sense of the tone um, that she uses in discussing her research with other researchers and with a lay audience. The next part of the project involves having a conversation. So I had a conversation with Claire to ask her exactly what it was that we needed to provide. Um, we wanted to look at the colours that she wanted to have associated with the project. I wanted to ask her how many colors she needed. Um, and I have to say that I was slightly shocked when the answer was maybe 30. I um, wasn't sure that that was doable, but we did, we did pull it off in the end. Um, and also asked about any color semantics that we should include. Um, she'd asked about the positive to negative scale, but didn't want it to be uh, green and red. So I had a look at how we could do that as well. And um, I asked her what types of plots she tends to use a lot so that I could make sure that whatever I tried, um, I could test out um, on those types of plots. Um, and also how much personality she wanted to convey in the formatting of the text. When I asked Claire about the colours that she wanted for her project, um, she said that she wanted something feminine but not sickly sweet, which makes a lot of sense. Um, and uh, those of you who've come to some of my workshops before may know that one of the things I like to do is start from a photo um, or a piece of art. Um, so here is the, the work of art that I uh, thought would be a good starting point for a colour palette for this project. Um, and what I did was I took this image, uh, which is a painting by Leon Morocco, and I fed it into Image Color Picker and then also into the Chroma.js color palette helper and um, tweaked them a little bit and came up with a scale uh, that seems to scale nicely to, to nine colors, which is um, 
probably the maximum that I would normally recommend people use, but because we did want the requirement of 30, I tried to push it and see what we could get, and yes, it did work. Um, I managed to get 32 colours um, that the, the, the palette helper thinks are distinct enough. In terms of font inspiration, there are some constraints to work with, so we want to make it easy for the end user, so for Claire and her team, um, and so we want to find fonts that are easy to find and to install. Um, and also because R plays nicely with um, true type fonts, it was easier to use those as well. We want something that has versions for italics and bold, and we want it to not do anything too weird with numbers and to include all the special characters that we need. Um, so I used uh, Google Fonts and typed in some phrases that I knew she was going to be using, um, and also some letters that are quite useful in making sure that we can distinguish between them very easily. And this is the font that I suggest um, for the, the headers in the plots. The main thing I was looking for here actually was a very aggressive bottom to that G. I wanted it to be very clear that it was a G and not a C um, because I knew that that would be a word that would come up often enough. Um, and then finding a font that matches that, um, if you want to be looking into that more, I recommend um, Oliver Schundefer's font matrix. We've got our colors and we've got our fonts and we're now really onto the implementation stage. What we're gonna do is use the anchor colors that we had a look at just now in the uh, palette checker and create a list with them. And we're gonna call that list Ophelia Colors uh, because that's gonna be the, the theme of this package. Um, and then we can use that list and the colors inside it to create a bunch of different color palettes. So we've got our default one, we can focus on just using the cool colors or just using the warm colors. And we can create a negative to positive one um, and I also thought I would add in a palette that's just greens and ones that just purples just to mix things up a little bit but keep it still anchored in the same group of colours. And what we're going to do at this point is feed those colour palettes into a bespoke function that we're calling scale colour Ophelia um, and that function makes use of ggplot's discrete scale and the colour ramp palette and also the scale colour gradient n to use those anchor colors and kind of stretch them out so that we've got enough colors for the plots that we are working on. Um, and I've added a few extra touches to that function um, so we can reverse the order if we want to, um, we can say continuous or not, um, and then there are different color palettes that we can use. So we're using the default one um, as our default one and then we can change that um, to the color palettes that we've just created. Um, earlier as well if we want to. The last thing we need to create for our package is a theme function. So we've got theme Ophelia and the aim is to remove the clutter and um, to add some custom fonts and some text hierarchy to make sure that the margins are relative to the text sizes and we can use things like element markdown or element text box simple to add some easy formatting for the title and the subtitle and avoid them running off the side of the plot. Um, and ultimately to achieve a consistent aesthetic with very little effort uh, that goes beyond just the, the colour scheme. And again, in building this, I've added a few options that we can toggle. And there we have it, we've got all the components of our package, so let's give it a whirl. Um, as, I said, as I said at the start, uh, the whole point of this is to enable the research team to get from a basic plot to a really nice looking plot that fits with the rest of their project uh, with just two lines of code, so let's just show what that looks like. Here we've got a very basic ggplot, and um, this is all the code that goes into it, um, and it produces this, which we all uh, have learned to, to love and to know well. Um, and as I said, two extra lines, we add the colour scale and we add the theme, and it's transformed into something that is already uh, perfectly acceptable for a presentation or a publication, um, and that fits with the, the branding of the project. We can also apply this if we've got a continuous scale, um, and if we're using a fill rather than a, a colour. And again, it does the same thing. Um, we might want to increase the text size. We can do that fairly easily as well. Um, and maybe we want to try something a bit different. So let's go for the cool colors palette um, and remove the background color um, and see what that does. It works pretty well for the bars as well as it did for the dots. Um, donuts, anyone know if penguins like donuts? Not sure, but again, we can make a quick change to make that work. Um, and finally, that positive to negative scale um, for this is the last trick I'll show you, but it allows us to make use not only of the theme, but also of um, the extra arguments that we can feed into the functions that are inside the bespoke function that we've created. Um, and you can also keep building on your plot. Um, the next steps um, are to add a table styling function. 
to finalise the documentation, to share the package with the whole team, and we'll do that fairly straightforwardly with a um, GitHub installation from a private repo. Um, we will then provide a bit of ggplot training for the team um, and keep an eye out for Ophelia plots um, in the wild, which I'm looking forward to seeing. That's it from me. I'm not sure if we've got time for questions, but if you do have a question, just feel free to reach out and uh, we can maybe chat about it over coffee. Um, enjoy the rest of the conference and I hope to see you around. Oh, thank you so much. That was a really fantastic presentation about how to customize some color palettes to your business needs. And I see that Kara was answering questions in the chat. So hopefully everyone's up to date and we can just keep moving since we started a couple minutes behind. Um, so let's